We finally have reached the end of Roxana, and as you will have seen if you read to the end, uh, there is a lot of ambiguity at the end of the book. And specifically, I think there even is some ambiguity about what kind of genre we're looking at here. Uh, at the very end, we almost have a murder mystery introduced to us, but we're not even sure if the murder has been committed or entirely sure at all. Um, so we see that Roxana discusses the possible, probable murder of her daughter by Amy. And we don't really have much information beyond that. And one of the really, the things I want you to notice as we end the book is how Roxana is not being quite as forthright with us as she was at the beginning. We have a progression and rather than Roxana giving us more and more information as the book comes to an end, we almost feel like we have less information about Roxana as a character. And even specifically the, uh, these things like uh, the, the murder of her daughter, whose name is also Susan, we just don't have all of the details. And we also don't really have the details of what specifically happens to Roxana at the very, very end of the novel. Uh, the final sentenced, um, or the part of the final sentence, the blast of heaven seemed to follow the injury done the poor girl by us both. I was brought so low again that my repentance seemed to be the only consequence of my misery as my misery was of my crime. So that's not a very straightforward ending. And so we'll talk a little bit about that today. Before we get to that though, I do want to just do a quick recap of some of the things that we've talked about in general with this book. We talked about um, uh, how this book emerges out of what was essentially the 18th century self-help genre. So periodicals indebted to John Dunton's Athenian Mercury and these this genre that uh, people in periodicals would, would ask questions. And Defoe probably drew a lot of his uh, details in the, the book and his the specifics of how he goes about writing a novel. He draws a lot of that from that genre. He draws from many other things too, but that is one particularly influential part of his writing style. We also have, we had a discussion about realism and the novel. And today I want to talk a little tiny bit more about how we see something called psychological realism possibly emerging as well. So not just realism as in attention to particular details, but also really trying to get someone's psychological state down on paper and describe it. And it's not always straightforward. I think as I've we talked about with, with the with realism in general, we don't always get uh, um, we get lots of details, but that doesn't always give us a very, very clear picture. I mean, I think when you introduce something like psychology, sometimes it makes the plot and our understanding of the characters even more complicated and less straightforward. And we also talked about Defoe's interest in women's fiction and how he was trying to write a book that was about, you know, trying to appeal to women in particular, or what he thought um, women would appreciate what women would want to read about. And in part that includes interest in um, describing Roxana's early marriage, describing her family, describing her accomplishments, but then he takes it beyond that too. And one of the things I really want to stress about Roxana as a book is that it is very much an experiment. It, there's a lot of experimentation in the book that might help us in some ways understand what is going on with the ending. And we also talked about the term Orientalism and how Roxana sees her identity as being linked to that costume. And we we talked about this already, but I think in the, at the very end of the book, we see how Roxana continues to talk about that costume. And it just is this very influential uh, moment in the book that keeps on returning again and again and again. This is something that Defoe does, um, is that he... He brings up an image, this is, I mean, many contemporary authors do this as well, bring back an image again and again and again to show us the importance. But I do think that it's, as modern readers, it's helpful to think about why Roxana returns again and again to this costume that was taken from a woman who was then enslaved and silenced, and thinking about the significance of the costume in, in light of that fact. Uh, so... When one of the things I uh, wanted to also touch on in terms of the plot developments at the very end of the novel, 
we see how Roxana is someone who Defoe wants us to see how she's someone who makes her own way in the world. And she describes herself as very self-reliant. She doesn't want to combine her income. She, or she doesn't want to have control of her money taken away from her. And there's this great moment towards the end of the novel, the beginning of the section of the reading for today, where Roxana finally combines her money with her husband's and she realizes that, that he is very wealthy as well. She wasn't totally sure if he was. She thought that he had some misfortunes, but it turns out he's also very wealthy. And his wealth, it turns out, is in some ways tied to, he says, the East India Company. He has some investments with the East India Company, specifically a ship uh, with the East India Company. And the East India Company uh, and also um, the Royal Africa Company, other um, companies, trading companies that were granted a monopoly over English trade and that had, um, that were made by royal charter. Um, this was something that was very important at the, during this period. And I think it, that allows a bit of a conversation, allows us to talk a little bit about how, um, how these commodities are being produced abroad and we see um, mention of these commodities, we see mention of the profits that come from um, Roxana's investments, for instance. There's a lot of ambiguity about what specifically Roxana is investing in, but I think that we get a little bit more clarity here. Um, and we we don't get, what we don't get is, we don't get much of an, much insight into the process of how these commodities are being produced. And I think this is yet another moment where there is this reference to the um, the slave labor that produces them, but Defoe doesn't really go into detail. We don't have much detail, but it's there, and it's it's a, an important part of the book nonetheless. So, moving on, then other thing I wanted to talk about is just the type of language that we're seeing at this in this type of, in this last part of the book. We see, as I've mentioned before, a lot of foreshadowing language. So, for instance, um, on page. 260 of the print edition, we see that Roxana um, says um, she's worried that something is going to happen to her. And she's been saying this all along. She says this uh, ever since um, that moment where she repented, or did she? She sort of had this moment of inauthentic repentance. And she keeps on coming back to this idea of, of what is going to happen to her, how she's going to be punished at the end. And this is as somewhat unusual for a book too. I mean, how often does um, does the heroine think about the punishment that's going to be dealt to her throughout the entire novel? And so she says on page 260, in a word, it never lightened or thundered, but I expected the next flash would penetrate my vitals and melt the sword, my soul, in the scabbard of flesh. It never blew a storm of wind, but I expected the fall of some stack of chimneys or some part of the house would bury me in its ruins and so of other things. I mean, this is noteworthy. One of the things to know about Daniel Defoe is he almost died in, um, in the storm of 1703 when his house of brick almost came collapsing down on him. So we have some real life comparisons to be making here as well. Yeah, but just looking at, just take a look and see if you can notice this language, this foreshadowing language building up in the last part of the book. And then especially at the very end, we have just a continuation of that foreshadowing language. So then the question turns to what exactly is being foreshadowed? And of course, at the end of the book, we see Susan, Roxana's daughter, be become incredibly persistent in threatening to expose Roxana. And she is a danger to Roxana's you know, li livelihood and her her life in luxury. And this, I think one of the things that springs up is Roxana's lack of a maternal impulse. This is something that the book talks about the entire way through, but especially here we see Roxana is trying to set her some of her children up for life and she tries to do this, but then at the same time, she doesn't want to get too close. And she talks about, for instance, how she doesn't really love her son by the Dutch merchant, um, her husband, who she is, you know, she, she loves the Dutch merchant, but she does not love this child. She wants to do right by him. And also, I mean, she does continually say to the reader that she doesn't want Amy to murder Susan. Um, much good that does. But she doesn't want that to happen. She doesn't want her daughter to be murdered. But she doesn't, she wouldn't mind if her daughter just dies in an accident. This is what she says um, at the end of the novel. And... Um, so just in terms of thinking about how the novel is building up to the ending, 
we really we kind of see how this is all this is coming to this this really explosive conclusion where presumably um, Susan dies and I just want to say um, a little bit too about the alternate endings about how the how the book ends and how um, we really see Roxana being punished in some ways at the end, but the punishment isn't specific enough. It's specifically not specific enough for some of the people who read this book. And this book was not under copyright law. Copyright law really did not exist. And so people took this book and rewrote the types of endings that they wanted to see at the end of the novel, what they wanted to happen to Roxana. And so there are lots and lots and lots of endings. And some of them most of them punish Roxanne in some way. So in one, she goes to jail and then she becomes a repentant Christian and her repentance is real this time. In one ending, um, she dies uh, of a sickness. In one ending, Amy contracts a venereal disease and then Roxanne loses her money in a shipping accident. And we actually get this great description of um, how these ships crash and her money just evaporates. That's a pretty good one. I like that one a lot. But I think just this, this idea of why we need to punish Roxana, why readers in particular felt the need to punish Roxana, is really one to dwell on as we come to the end of the book. And what that, why, why there needed to be specifics of this punishment. And for next week, we have another heroine in Phantomina who disguises herself again and again and again. And some of the same of those questions are coming up in terms of whether or not we're ending up with a quote-unquote feminist ending or whether or not the, the heroine becomes is punished at the end of the novel or at the end of the novella of Eliza Haywood's novella, Phantomina. And again, we get this ambiguity and complexity um, surrounding this, this character. Um, and so I think that there are going to be some, some comparisons we can draw between these books. I hope we'll be able to talk a little bit about the ending of Roxana next week and tie it in some ways to Phantomina, which is also a great read. It's a pretty short read as well.